today. And um, she got this book to give out. Um, it's by Joe Weston. And he talks a lot about what she was trying to say last night. And so I just wanted to offer this up as a gift to, all right, can somebody think of a good way to give it out? Trivia. What? Fight to the death? Throw it, yeah. OK. Beer. OK, so the first person to bring me a beer gets it. <laughs> no, that's mine. <laughs> she, no, she volunteered. <laughs> no, no, no. We're we're just wasting time right now. <laughs> Anybody? No bringing the beer. Okay. So I think we're about to get started. Uh, welcome to day two of the SmooCon Fire Talks. What? Come on, some some noise, man. Come on. Do you guys only get loud when I give out free stuff? Come on. <laughs> we have to spread it out a little. Um, all right, so this is what fire talks are. If you were here last night, I don't want to go through it again. Does anybody have a question on what fire talks are? Okay, cool. All right, these are our awesome sponsors. Milton Security Group is giving away this cool ass uh, parrot helicopter thing, right? And an iPod, no, excuse me, a uh, mini iPad to go with it. So thank you, Milton. Then we have the combination of folks that put some money in for the second prize, which is a laptop, which interestingly enough doesn't seem to be working right now, so I think I'm going to let Georgia have a whack at it. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that was brought to you by Leverage Consulting, Lars, and Dirty Sec. Thank you. And then lastly, a um, iPod Touch <laughs> or a mini iPad by Liquid Matrix Security Digest. Thank you. Um, so also we are giving away some awesome gifts and once again the consortium of Leverage Consulting, Lars and Dirty Sec. All these t-shirts, these gifts that I'm throwing out here, um, thanks. And, and also uh, Bulb Security, who is doing some of the streaming and recording work here, as well as uh, with, with uh, Mr. I Mr. Iron Geek over here. All right, so um, it takes a lot of time to put these things together. Um, and these are the folks that have stepped up and really helped me out. Um, for, I just wanted to give a big thank out to uh, Jack Daniel. He helped out with sponsorship. He's also the timekeeper and with the call for paper review. <laughs> also associated with doing the call for paper review was Jason Oliver. He's right up here. And uh, Sarah Clark, where is she? She's also ordering pizza for us. So she's probably waiting there, but she also helped out with a call for papers as well as she's blogging this event and, and, and uh, live tweeting it. Uh, and then I also wanted to thank uh, Nathy, who also helped out with a call for papers. He was speaker wrangler uh, and helping out with some of the volunteer dinner stuff. Uh, and then with the judging, so as you know, we have those three prizes. Uh, da Kahuna pulled in Mr. Mubix, Ro Miss Rogue Clown, and Miss Soap Turtle to help judge that. Anybody? How come everybody gets the name of me? I'm not good enough? <laughs> <laughs> it's 
sorry. Uh, where are they? Any judges? Mrs. Smoove. All right. They're not here. And I already mentioned Georgia and Adrian. Uh, security, very important. We don't want people without badges here. So we had dated security and Casey Dunham. Um, this is the schedule for this evening. Uh, lots of awesome talks. Uh, what I really like here is that there's a focus on, you know, really fixing up old tools. Uh, you know, like tools that haven't been addressed in, or, that, you know, probably about five, six years old. And these people stood up and updated them for the security community. Um, but we're going to have Craig Heffer, John Sawyer, Eric Millen, Doug Burks, and Travis Goodspeed to finish things up. And without further ado, that's all I have. And I'll throw out some, some prizes while Craig gets sets up. People for their, what their boxing intro would be. And so <laughs> this is what Craig passed on to me. So this is the Sultan of Swat, the King of Crash, the Colossus of Clout. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Craig. You can give that a prize to whoever knows what that movie that's from. So. I heard some, someone called it out. Called someone out the right movie. Out. All right. I've heard like a bunch of people in this general area. So I'll, I'll just love it. There we go. All right, so I'm Craig Hefner. Um, I work as a security researcher for Tactical Network Solutions. And if you haven't already heard about the WPS vulnerability that was released last month, yeah, still last month now, um, I'm going to talk about it today. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Wi-Fi protected setup, it's really push button security for people who don't know how to set up wireless security, right? The idea is most end users just don't know how to do it. So the Wi-Fi Alliance said, okay, we're we're going to set up a uh, we're going to set up a protocol that makes it easy, um, and so pretty much any access point or wireless router you buy today has WPS support and it's enabled by default. So basically, it works. You push a button on the access point, you push a button on the client you want to connect to your wireless network, and they set up a secure connection, exchange of information, and now the client has all the information he needs to connect to your access point, including the WPA key. But there's a little bit more to the protocol than that, right? So, so, so that piece we talked about, we kind of talked about the client and the access point. Most people kind of know about that piece. There's kind of this third party that's a little bit hidden, and that's the registrar. So the registrar actually is the entity that handles the WPS transactions with the client. And usually that's the access point. The access point has a registrar inside it, so they're one and the same. But the protocol specifies that an access point has to support external registrars too. So a registrar is, like I said, the one that handles all the WPS transactions. So in order to do that, the registrar has to know what the WPA key is, what the SSID is, so that he can authenticate clients and then give them the right settings. Uh, alternatively, registrars can reconfigure wireless settings on access points. So let's say we want to become a registrar. Well, in order to become a registrar, you have to know the access point's PIN number. So this is obviously for security. You don't want just anyone coming along and becoming a registrar on your network. Um, it can be done over 802.11, so it can be done wirelessly. And there's no re user interaction required, unlike adding a client where you have to push a button. There's no user interaction to add a registrar. So if you want to, say, guess WPS pins in order to become a registrar, well, they're eight digits long. The last digit is a checksum, so you really only have to brute force seven digits. But that's still 10 million possible pins. And the WPS protocol actually is, for the most part, really well implemented. Um, they took a lot of time to, to work out the protocol and prevent a lot of different types of attacks, including offline brute force attacks. So you really only have the option of doing an active attack. <clears throat> However, if you look at the spec, there's a section that talks about splitting passwords. Um, and that's, that's probably bad. So basically, the WPS is landman for wireless. <laughs> they, took, they take the pin, they cut it in half, 
and they authenticate each half individually. So instead of having to brute force a seven digit pin, you brute force one four digit pin and one three digit pin, which leaves you with 11,000 possible combinations. And practically you can only really do one pin attempt per second because a lot of access points don't really have a lot of processing power, but still that only takes three hours. So in three hours you get the access point pin and then the access point will give you the WPA key. It's fun. So it actually gets a little worse when you start looking at actual implementation flaws. <laughs> so, so the protocol itself is, is obviously not securely implemented, right? But that's, that's the protocol spec. Some ISPs, who will go unnamed, there's a nice big one in Switzerland, um, actually set the same pin for all of the routers that they give to all of their customers. So you just say, hey, this is the pin, and now you can get everybody's WPA key. <clears throat> so I wrote Reaver, which much like a honey badger just doesn't give a fuck about your wireless security. Um, <laughs> we, I was watching that video last night, so I had to add that in the slides. Um, basically, it's going to run through all the possible pin combinations, starting with those very popular pins, obviously. And then it's just going to walk through every one, and basically, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go through and it's going to say, hey, is this first half of the pin right? And the router will say, no, it's not. OK. Well, is this one right? No. Is this one right? Yes. Oh, good. We got the first half. And then it goes on to working on the second half. Hey, is the second half of the pin right? No. Is the second half of the pin right? Yes. Oh, well, now we have the first half of the pin and the second half of the pin. And then we say, OK, give us your settings. And it'll print out the pre-shared key for, or rather, the um, the, the key for the network, as, as well as the SSID. Um, and it typically takes, it depends on the access point, but it takes anywhere from three to ten hours to do this. And it is an active attack, but you can pause it and come back and resume. Um, and three to ten hours for a WPA key, to put that in perspective, is really good. <laughs> um, so, if you're an end user, you can disable WPS if A, your router even gives you that option, or B, your router actually disables WPS when you tell it to. Um, Linksys is actually notorious for this. All the Linksys routers I've looked at don't actually disable WPS when you tell it to. Yeah. So vendor mitigations, really the only thing vendors can do right now is, is to lock WPS after some reasonable number of pin attempts, right? So after 10 pin attempts, just stop accepting pins. Some actually do this already, Netgear in particular, although some of them only block you for like a minute and then let you try again. And some of them block you out indefinitely. So if they block you out for a minute, it's really not that big deal. It slows you down, but it'll take maybe a day or two. Um, so if you want Reaver, it's open source. Um, you can go to our website at tacnetsoul.com slash products. There's a link to the open source code. Um, <clears throat> the original advisory, so this, I wasn't apparently the only one looking at this. Um, the original advisor is actually put out by um, Stefan uh, Wiebach, who was working on it independently for me, so we both kind of found it at the same time. Um, you can go to his website for the original uh, vulnerability that he published. And if you really like reading specifications and paying $100 for a specification, you can go to the Wi-Fi Alliance's site and get that too. Um, we also actually have, if, if you want to support my children, and make sure they can, they can eat. We have a pro version of Reaver, which is a nice little embedded box you just connect to. It's got a little web interface on it, and that's on our site also. So really, that's, that's WPS. The attack is not that complicated, and it works quite well. I had several people come up to the conference and like, oh yeah, I broke into my neighbor's Wi-Fi. It was awesome. I was like, don't tell the cops that. <laughs> so yeah, um, question? So, so actually, it's interesting. Um, none of the ones that I've seen um, lock out by Mac. They, they, it's like a global lock. Um, I did actually get one person who reported to me today that he found some device. He didn't actually tell me what device it was, which is less than helpful. But he did say that, that his device um, only locks out by Mac. So if he changes his Mac, then he could continue the attack. Um, but, but for all the ones I've looked at, and I would assume the majority, it's a global lock. They just don't accept any pins from anyone. 
No, no. I mean, it's not going to kick clients off that are already on. I mean, WPS is like a one-time thing, right? You use it just to get your client the WPA key so you don't have to remember it and put it in manually. And then once they have the WPA key, they, you don't have to do WPS again. So it's, not, it, it's typically not going to lock anyone out. Yeah, run VMware. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so, the, so DDWRT, Tomato, and OpenWart do not support WPS. Um, well, so, so, so there is a version of DDWRT that runs on the Buffalo that they specifically made for Buffalo routers. Um, and they do support a version of WPS. I have not tested that. So I don't know, but but if you just like grab the open source stuff from the website, it doesn't have WPS support. Yeah, the airport extremes don't. They have like their own their own setup thing. They don't support WPS. MyFi's MyFi's do support WPS, <laughs> and that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> So most people use the push button mode. Um, but again, we're not really attacking the push button mode. We're attacking like the registrar feature. So it doesn't really matter if you even use WPS. So you can set up a, a WPA key manually, but as long as WPS is still enabled, it'll just give us whatever WPA key you set on the access point. So. Oh yeah, there, there are some that will, so, so some are a little tricky. Some will say WPS is disabled and it's not really. Some will say that they've locked WPS but they don't actually lock it. Some will say they locked WPS, they'll act like they don't lock it, but they'll always respond saying you got the wrong pin even, you, even if you got the right pin. So there are definitely some weird implementation things in there that you have to take into account. Um, and there's a bunch of like crazy options in Reaver, like the options list is forever long and that's because I ran into all these weird things. You just have to play around with the options and find which one works. Um, which we, we have a nice database if you, if you pay for the pro version and support my children. <laughs> you know what? My kids are hungry. They eat so much. It's like every other day, eat, eat, eat. And any other questions? Nothing? All right, well, I will be, if you do have any questions, I'll be at the TNS booth all of tomorrow. It's like a half day tomorrow, whatever. But I'll be there. Feel free to stop by. Stop by. We've got live Reaver demos running. It's great fun. Thanks a lot. Who really wants a t-shirt? Is uh, Johnny Bravo here? Yes. Okay, cool. You're next after this talk. I got a cool lead flashlight. If anybody, of course, they, I don't know. Oh well, a broken lead flashlight. Okay.
Yeah, it's split screening. How do you? You just, you just want to do it like that? Do you want to try my adapter? No, it's um, PowerPoint split. You know, doing the split screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, it seemed to work. Swap displays. Or something. All right. There's pizza back there. It's supposed to be for volunteers only. Right. It's not a PowerPoint. Is the way? Are you using PowerPoint or what? Yeah. It's not the thing in PowerPoint to say don't send to a split screen or just send. It. In other words, mirror. Or do you need a um, presentation view on this one for notes or something?
Also, in my power, I know on power on Windows you can set what resolution can, is displayed can at. Can you do it like non screen? You know, just just do it like that. Sure. Or something. I don't know. I mean, it kind of sucks, but. This is. It's hard. It shows, but then as soon as he goes into. While we fix this, maybe, maybe like a few things here, but. We have the cool glow in the dark stickers. Now, these do not go far, so if you want it, you're gonna have to run up to the front of the room, so. See, it doesn't, no, no, no nothing. You have to, you have to give it up, man. <laughs> yeah, we can do that, hold on. Is it not going up? See, so. I'm not sure where it is. I'm pretty sure I know where it is in Windows. If I thought it was a setting there, you can say, Display at this resolution, but I'm not seeing. Alright, who's the next? Where is he? Where is that possible? Are you, are you, are you sure? Because, can okay, you just go with doing it that Yeah. Okay, I mean, this is really sad. Actually, try one more. I mean, are there any fancy, like, do you have any fancy build things or anything like that? Yeah. I find that incredibly frustrating. Format? I know. Uh, I don't know. We're not looking at it for quite a while. I've heard We're going to just keep it like that. Is that cool? Sorry, just had a few technical difficulties there. Um, very, very odd, but we, for some reason it doesn't work in presentation mode. Um, so uh, this is John Sawyer, and his boxing intro is the Packet Monkey from CTF, team first in Guardians pen testing ace, the Pwntastic. Everybody welcome John Sawyer. Thank you. So, you know, he mentioned, uh, you know, Team Last Place. I used to do a lot of uh, packet monkey work for, uh, you know, Alice over there uh, with Team Last Place and DEF CON uh, doing CTF. And um, part of what I've been thinking about recently is um, doing passive OS fingerprinting and application fingerprinting and um, network service, network client fingerprinting all through uh, IDS. Um, kind of thinking about it a different way. I'm losing my mic. So, now how many of you saw that P0F was re released, a uh, new version 3, just a few weeks ago? Yeah. That, that happened the same day that I submitted the abstract for this talk. <laughs> Completely unrelated. I'll just like to take credit that, you know, Mikhail somehow saw that I was uh, doing this type of fingerprinting with an IDS, and he said, hey, you know, I need to re release a new version because mine's six years old. And uh, yes, I know it's back. Uh, we'll get there. We'll talk about it uh, and some of the features and kind of how it differs from what I'm looking to do uh, using traditional IDS uh, engine like Snort or the new uh, Suricata IDS engine. Uh, just a little background about me. Uh, senior security analyst within Guardians. Um, I do a little writing for Dark Reading. Um, I've written a Metasploit module for uh, working with Shodan uh, search engine. And it seems like every time I come up with, with a new idea for writing a Metasploit module, it's already been done. Um, I like to think about how um, HD Moore made a comment when he was doing his VX research where uh, he's like, I'm basically a vulnerability archaeologist. You know, I find these bugs that I think is really cool, and then I find out someone did it four years ago. And that was when he was talking about VxWorks and how he noticed that when he was scanning the internet looking for the UDP debugging port, he went back and looked at DShield data and saw that someone did the same exact thing in 2006. So um, that's how I feel. I start writing some of these things. I spend a day or two on them and then see that, well, somebody else did it too. So um, used to do CTF with uh, Atlas and Cybertex and some of those guys had a lot of fun. Um, and I liked to mountain bike, which uh, people laugh when they know that I live in Florida, which is obviously not a very mountainous area. But we have some cool trips. So 
And some of them are kind of dangerous and make you bleed. Uh, yes, Gainesville. Um, and then I have some kids that are a lot of fun, uh, four of them that keep me very busy when I'm not uh, in front of the computer. And uh, I like to think I have a little aspiring hacker right there. See, he's, uh, we were in a... Is that the one upstairs? <laughs> What's that? Is that the ATM upstairs? Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, I, I haven't started bringing my kids to HackerCons yet because they, uh, they're, they're a little young, I think. So, um, But yeah, so they, there he was uh, punching in uh, ATM and um, it ended up in maintenance mode. I have no idea what he was pressing. <laughs> <laughs> but we left really quick because, uh, you know, I didn't know how to explain it. And I mean, he was probably there for about five or ten minutes and so was, they would have known it was him. Um, but. So what is passive fingerprinting? Um, the opposite of active fingerprinting. When you think about you know, fingerprinting hosts and stuff, you know, most people are using Nmap to scan a host, figure out what uh, you know, ports are open, banners, and that type of stuff. Well, with passive fingerprinting, you, know, you want to have as little impact on the network as possible. You, know, you can do it from the network side. You can do it from uh, you know, something that's plugged into a span on a, on a network uh, switch, or you can do it via tap. Um, you can also do sniffing on the client or server side. Um, if you do uh, any p pen testing, you know, if you're sniffing on the actual system that you're testing from, I mean, you, you can find all kinds of interesting things in your logs as you go back and look at that later with, uh, you know, an IDS or, you know, with certain rules and stuff. Um, when you look at the history of passive fingerprinting, it's traditionally been based around identifying operating systems. There's been a few things that have happened over the last you know, three or four years where they've started looking at some other stuff. But you know, really, for the most part, when you know, P0F came out, it was looking at you know, certain signatures that would identify operating systems. Um, that's changed with the recent release, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so P0F then. You know, it was written by uh, Michael Zalewski, uh, the same guy that wrote Rat, Pox Rat Proxy, um, Skip Fish, he wrote a couple of books, Silence on the Wire and the Tangled Web. And then, uh, you know, he's an avid ph photographer. Um, so those are a couple of pictures from his website. So, you know, very interesting photography. If you have a chance, go and take a look. But um, Mikhail's a very, very smart, bright person and put together a great tool. Unfortunately, it had not been developed in about six years. So, you know, the people were still using it, but it just wasn't well updated. You know, there was no uh, current fingerprints for modern day OSs or um, mobile devices. There were a couple of people out that had kind of put a few updated uh, signatures, but there was really no coordinated effort behind that. Um, it was really cool from the aspect that it could do network address um, translation detection. So I used to work in a, a very large environment, um, a university environment. And one of the things that we would have a problem with is um, to, there was a, a NAC solution in place and to get on the network, you'd have to sign in. Well, there were these uh, frat houses that became kind of problematic because they would put up these um, wireless routers that you know, the first person that logs in, well, they would authenticate, but now you'd have 20 other people logging in and now you couldn't identify which one of them was you know, torning porn and you know, copyrighted materials and different things like that. So we actually would run P0F on the network and it was really handy at detecting, you know, these NAT devices. So, you know, P0F, really great tool, um, but hadn't been developed until the day I submitted my abstract. So now it still provides the same passive OS fingerprinting it did before. It still provides NAT detection, but one of the new beta features that was added is that it understands HTTP. So it starts fingerprinting HTTP requests and responses. Now, it's really limited right now. Um, there's only just um, a few signatures, I guess, in there, mostly for Apache 2X servers. Um, it does have some kind of uh, older and what he, he relates as um, exotic browsers um, that are, are being detected. But uh, one of the things he said he wants to add is additional services like FTP, SMTP, SSH, and SSL. Um, I definitely recommend taking a look. It is a cool tool. Um, but we've got more stuff on the way. Um, DHCP fingerprinting, this is something that uh, has been researched over the last, um, I'd say, 
about two years ago or so is when the, the first paper that I'd seen had come out. And what they're doing is they're fingerprinting uh, passively based on looking at the DHCP options that our clients are sending out. You know, so, you know, machine comes on the, on the wire, it sends out DHCP request, it has certain uh, DHCP options set, so you can, you know, s s create a relatively unique identifier for those. It's not super accurate, but um, there's a website out there called fingerbank.org. <laughs> See, I, I, yes, I had to stress finger bank because usually when I say that, people giggle because they think I said finger bang, but yes, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a couple of tools that are using uh, finger, the finger bank uh, DHCP fingerprinting database, uh, Packet Fence, uh, Network Miner, and Satori. Um, Prads, Prads is a, another passive OS fingerprinting tool out there. It has, some of these features here, um, I think the limitation with this one right now is signatures. Um, it's, a, it's a cool tool, there, there's some nice features there, but um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of active development in, in providing signatures so that you know, it has a lot of coverage for the devices that are in the network. And then there's some commercial tools with passive capabilities, and these are, these are really interesting because what I, what I like about the commercial tools that are out there is they, they provide uh, kind of more depth to what you can do with, you know, passively. They actually identify vulnerabilities. So we're, there's nothing in the open source world that really does passive vulnerability detection. There's some cool commercial tools, yes, they do it. But no one's really kind of delved into that area passively, you know, in the open source world. So, I'm blaming Josh Wright for this project. Um, Josh Wright is an awesome guy. I, I used to work with him at NGuardians before he left to go write a uh, wireless security course. And he had sent out an email beginning of December that said, we need a, an extreme makeover for passive fingerprinting. You know, there's problems where you know, companies can't keep up with their growing environment. There's all these mobile devices that are being introduced. We have you know, companies that are adopting multi-platform, you know, everything from Mac to Linux and, you know, their traditional Windows systems. Um, you know, P0F hasn't been updated in six years until now. And um, there's these cool commercial tools out there, but there's nothing in the open source world. So I talked to Josh for a bit. I talked to, um, I think, uh, DigiNinja is around here somewhere. I talked to him a little bit. Um, and trying to decide like, what's kind of the best approach. And for me, I spent a lot of time in the defense world doing uh, IDS, uh, incident response. And so for me, it just kind of made sense. Like, why rewrite a tool? Why not leverage the, the capabilities that Snore and the new um, Suricata IDS engine have? I mean, they're already designed to tear apart packets and designed for you to write signatures for them. And the signatures are really easy. I mean. Well, they can get complex, but for the most part, you know, a lot of people understand snort signatures, they know how to write snort signatures, so it just kind of seems to make sense to, to build something around using a common language uh, and, and leverage that community. So what I'm, what I'm putting together is a, a collection of signatures that uh, I'm starting with mobile devices and mobile applications just because uh, that's some of the research I'm already doing now. I'm working um, with a buddy, Kevin Johnson, and some other guys on um, basically mobile, mobile device security and looking at mobile apps, the insecurities. And so where it's going to start first is identifying mobile apps from a passive standpoint um, and then identifying actual vulnerable versions. So if you have um, you know, mobile devices connecting into your network, let's say, um, well, we'll get to, to the offensive side of it in a bit, but um, there's going to be a, a, there's a ma major focus on mobile devices and applications, the first part. But then we're going to dig into more of the traditional vulnerable services and applications, um, you know, web servers, web clients, all those, and then operating systems. And there's quite, the, the great thing about this is there's already a good community um, built around open source signatures. The uh, Emerging Threats Project is an awesome group, and they're are already numerous signatures in there for passive identification of uh, some different vulnerabilities, uh, mobile devices, and things like that. So we've got a good working base already with additional things that we're writing. Uh, use cases. 
from the offensive and defensive side, there's, there's a couple of different things that you can do. Uh, from defensive, obviously, identifying apps, devices, vulnerabilities on your network. I mean, that's a huge deal. And you know, if you don't have a lot of control over your environment, this makes a, a huge difference in being able to pinpoint those things, identify the assets, identify new things that pop up onto your network. Um, but the other thing is, you know, if you want to use it from a offensive perspective, you know, you can use it to, you know, wireless is really easy to do passive, um, you know, detection, passive fingerprinting. Um, have you ever been on a pen test and actually gained access to uh, the network infrastructure to where you could actually turn on a span? Yeah, that's, that's a pretty handy point. Um, you can do that. I, I've been in a situation where um, the IDS was open also. So uh, there wasn't very much seg segregation. So you know, getting into one of these network admins box, you actually had access to the IDS. And you, know, you could add a few more things onto the box and start sniffing, grab full packet captures, and process it through Snort with this rule set. Um, vulnerability research, you know, again, there's a big focus on mobile, mobile app security, mobile device security. So, you know, running this through, you know, a, a proxy or a gateway and, and pulling all the packets and then parsing it through, you have that ability to kind of dig in and find some of those things that you didn't know were, were leaking data out, you know, something that's sending out uh, information via, you know, HTTP basic. Um, and then, you know, looking at distribution of this, you know, it's going to be open source. Um, you can, you know, if you're already using uh, Snort or Suricata in your environment, you can use it as an additional rule source if you want, or you can run it uh, side by side. Um, it's no problem running multiple instances of, of Snort on a box. I mean, we, and when we were in the university to deal with the uh, 10 gig links, we would um, leverage multiple instances of Snort with uh, um, different subnets that they were broken up to actually increase performance. Um, and then we want to contribute back to the Emerging Threats uh, project. You know, I've got a buddy that's uh, working with me right now who is already one of the top contributors uh, to ET, and he also has access to a very, very large network um, that, we're being, that we're able to you know, pull a lot of sources of data from and actually create these uh, fingerprints. So. Um, and then that's about it, you know. Um, subtle hit. Subtle hit. <laughs> so, thank you. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to come up to me. I'm out of time, and uh, that's it. I want to thank all these wonderful people. Actually, I am interested in getting feedback on, on an answer. So. All right. It is. All right, so next up, we're going to be having Johnny Bravo. This is the jester of Jerry Springer. The guy who will text you at 4 a.m. to talk about his feelings. I, I should have gave him that book, actually. <laughs> The merchant of the man in the middle, ladies and gentlemen, Johnny Bravo. Yeah. Mic check, one, two. Are we good? All right, cool. How are you guys doing today? So just want to let you guys know I'm pretty nervous, so if I puke or pee myself, I apologize in advance. But it'll be, yeah, it'll make for a great comedy, so. Uh, and video, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, this talk is about the resurrection of Edercat. Originally it was gonna be called Resurrection. It's not just for Jesus anymore, but that got shot down. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we just went with resurrecting Edercat. And it's really more of a story of how a no-name douchebag like me just basically took over one of the most beloved you know, projects um, in pen testing. And it's really gonna go through uh, just some of my communications with Allure and basically how we got to where we're at and where we're going to go. So, who am I? Um, my name is Eric Milam. I'm a senior security consultant for Acuvant Labs. Uh, on the Twitters, I'm Bravo Hacks and uh, IRC. I'm known as Johnny Bravo. As I was saying, the Greg Brady Johnny Bravo, you can tell by looking at me, uh, I'm definitely not the cartoon Johnny Bravo. 
<laughs> you know, I am pretty. <laughs> so I just wanted a, a couple call outs first. Of course, Hackers for Charity. Yeah. Please give to Hackers for Charity. Total inspiration uh, to me in my career, in my life. Pure hate. Johannes Martin Boss sitting there. He's a... <laughs> He's, a, he's my brother from another mother. He's a, we do a bunch of pen tests together, and basically, I sleep, he does the work, and then I take the credit at the end. So, uh, definitely want to call it Johnny Long. Uh, again, an inspiration. And uh, he sent me an email this summer, which unknowingly gave me the confidence and uh, to do something like this. Um, so, thank you, Johnny. I appreciate that. I was the guy running around, fanboying out at the office that, jo that Johnny Long had just emailed me. So. And then Jason Street, he's my boy, he gave me the pep talk for this. He basically told me I was going to suck, but that was okay. Because everybody sucks, and everybody's their, their hardest critic. So, thank you very much, I appreciate it, I love that guy. So, so the topics we're going to cover, easy creds, uh, Ettercap, the 073 versus the 2.6.39-4 kernel that came out in Backtrack 5R1. Uh, communications with Allure and Naga. Uh, the release of Ettercap 074 Lazarus and the future of the tool. Some of the things we got planned that we want to do and, and hopefully you guys can give us more ideas and, and, and get us going. So Easy Creds. Easy Creds was just a simple bash script that I wrote that basically is really a wrapper for a lot of other man in the middle tools I use during a pen test. It loads up Ettercap as pretty much its anchor or its core. It also leverages SSL strip. D, uh, D sniff, URL snarf, uh, has an option for sidejacking which loads hamster and ferret. And then it also has other attacks, wireless attacks. It's got a, you can build a fake AP, it's got an evil twin AP, it's got uh, the Carmata split attack, as well as uh, I added MDK3 to DOS people off the network so they can connect to your fake AP. So, why did I write easy creds? Uh, well, I got a text one morning or an IM from somebody I worked with who was in Germany at a large company and they had just DOS a giant segment of the LAN. And apparently he was a Windows guy but he decided for whatever reason he was going to use Ettercat. Never used it before, didn't know how to set it up, didn't know what he was doing and, and the attack pretty much started with man Ettercat. So I pretty much told him, you know, that's really not the route to go. So I wrote, like, I went out on, the, on the, some forums, I found Lucifer had posted uh, how to set up a fake AP, and I just kind of took that, I uh, converted it into a bash script for him, and everything was kind of hard-coded. And then over the course of a year or so, it kind of became what it is now. So Ettercap, SSL strip, and the 2.6394 kernel. So Ettercap by itself, 073, no issues at all, it would run just fine, work, no errors. However, when you load up SSL strip with Ettercat in that kernel for whatever reasons, it starts throwing the L3 errors, and I don't know if anybody's ever experienced that, but if you Google for L3 errors, it's just a lot of other people asking what they are and not really a way to fix it. So I started dissecting kind of what was going on, and I noticed that when the IP tables were manually updated for the SSL strip portion is when the errors started to fly which is odd because apparently it's an EPIRM issue, but when you're in backtrack, you're running everything as root. So I, I still don't know why that was happening. I'm sure there's a lot, a lot of smart people out here could probably tell me and I would appreciate it. That would be awesome. Um, so easy creds was still successful, but now Ettercap was basically running out of resources within about five minutes and crashing. So I went to HackerCon and gave a talk on easy creds. Uh, I think it's automating man in the middle for winning. The talk led to an actual live discussion between me and Iron Geek at the time about the last official release of Ettercat. So I just said, what the hell? I'm just going to uh, email Laura Naga and tell him I'm taking over the project. So you know, hubris, no. Uh, stupidity, maybe. Probably. And most likely, most likely, yeah. Naive, definitely, right? But, I didn't care. I did it anyway. So here's the actual email that I sent to them. And you'll notice the subject line is, I've never talked to these people before. They have no idea, right? Request to officially take over Ettercap NG development. Basically, hey, we've done some things. Can we take over the project? So I get an email back from Allure uh, shortly after that. Uh, who are you? 
So we went ahead and we exchanged some emails. I showed him uh, easy creds. Um, one of the other guys who had fixed some, some issues, um, he'd sent him kind of his resume and stuff. And uh, within a couple hours, we were project admins on the source search page. So, holy shit, I'm in charge of EdgarCAD, right? This is, this is fucking badass, right? I, this, I would never have dreamed this would be, uh, be happening, and you know what? I was like on cloud nine, and it was awesome. And then it was, holy shit, I'm in charge of EdgarCAD, right? Because, I mean, it's EdgarCAD. Everybody knows it, everybody loves it. It's a brand or a commodity that everybody, everybody that I've talked to, even this weekend, has been like, oh my god, that's awesome, Edercap, I love it, and everybody has a story about it. So, you know, but why would I feel like that, right? Well, the doubts start to creep in, you know, what if we can't do it? What if it's no good? You know, what if people hate it? And then the other thoughts that come along with growing up in a house where your daddy didn't love you enough. So, but seriously, I mean, it's, it's one of those projects that you just can't get wrong. You just can't. So, when you look at it, here's my easy cred stats on the day that I sent out the email to Allure. You know, this is a project that I wrote really for myself and never expected anybody else to use. It's, as you can see, on October 24th, there was uh, 466 downloads, and I was, like, super proud of that. You know, it's awesome. Yeah, here's the stats for EdgarCap on that same day. 762,496 downloads. Not to mention all the repos that it exists in and all the distros that it's on, right? So what's that? 762,000 downloads more than, uh, more than uh, EasyCreds? Even Jesus was worried for me. <laughs> right? Like when, when the Son of God doesn't have your back, you're, uh, you should be a little bit concerned as well. But you know what, we did it. And on December 4th of 2011, 074 Lazarus was released with the full support of Alora Naga. They wrote a really nice passing of the torch. And um, you know, we got t-shirts made, so we know that it's an actual official project. Because <laughs> a project isn't a project without a t-shirt, right? So. So zero. Until you have a Facebook page. I, 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 that's not gonna happen. <laughs> yeah. So 074 Lazarus, what it really was is it was largely bug fixes and code cleanup. This was really at the request of Alora Naga because we came in and were like, we want to do all this stuff. And, you know, what do you think? And basically he said, hey, why don't you slow down? Let's just fix what's there first. And then we can think about what we want to do after that. We can start putting stuff together, you know. Uh, you guys can do whatever you want. Uh, you know, I asked him, you know, how much do you want to be involved? And he said, it's your baby now. You know, we're passing it over to you. You go ahead and go for it. So one of the things that he did say was it's got to compile on Lion, which uh, if anybody actually pulled the first push of, if, yeah, if anybody pulled the first push of the, of the, of the file, I, I pushed the wrong version. So it couldn't compile, but I didn't tell anybody for about two hours. So... Um, but the cool thing, you know, there was no more L3 errors, no more resource exhaustion. Like I said, we cleaned up a lot of the code. We just, we just tried to make sure uh, that it was as good as we can get it. Um, there's definitely still some issues w that we want to work through. There, you know, a couple of bugs that come up. Um, but for the most part, we got it out there. Uh, we got people talking about it again. And of course, I was on Google every day seeing who was talking about it. And I was really blown away and, at the excitement of people. So. So 075 assimilation, and that's the only thing I'm really part of the project for is to give these things names. So <laughs> Lazarus was my idea, and assimilation, it actually comes from uh, Piaget's uh, basically taking the external world, internalizing it, and taking it over. Um, <laughs> thanks. Uh, we, uh, we've already coded these things that are here. We've got the NBNS spoofing, which is going to be new. Um, I reached out to Moxie and said, hey, we're thinking about including an SSL strip functionality built into it. And, uh, he, you know, he kind of, I don't know if he gave us his blessing, but he let us know it was okay. So mul mul multiple filter loading, uh, IPv6 support, and other things that are definitely in the works, like a VoIP dissector of some kind, and 
uh, yeah, uh, we'd like to really do a, uh, an agent dropper that'll go out and so you can poison other broadcast domains. But we actually started talking about a major release. And I'm way more excited about this because we got some, some things that are cooking if we can really pull them off. You know, not just bug fixes. We really want to go to the next level. We don't just want to keep adding on to what's there. What we'd like to do is really EdderCap at its core is a router. And EdderCap becoming a tool for malicious routing, building a new kernel architecture, building an API, building an extension framework so that it has a core that runs that's self-aware that can look at its resources, it can drop communications if it needs to, if it's getting overwhelmed. The cool thing is, I'm sorry? Okay, yeah, so after all this we can talk and I definitely want feedback from the community because we, we want to make this for you guys. So, But what we're doing is the extension framework is basically you can just write whatever modules you want and plug it right into EdderCat. So it's not this, this all-encompassed thing. You can basically, anybody can write whatever they need to for whatever network they're in within Python or Perl or something and just plug it right in and it'll work with it. A current team, um, lead developer, Emilio Escobar, um, sick mind, zero chaos if he ever pushes any code. Um, <laughs> Pure, pure hate who's just here for, uh, for street cred. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. Don't forget to give the hackers for charity. Wait, I still have questions. We can talk about that outside. I believe that. <laughs> That's that the plan. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have hair like this guy, and then I should. This is by Doug Burks. He's going to be talking about the security onion. Uh, I've been reading a lot about this tool. It looks awesome. Good uh, stuff or bad stuff? Good stuff. OK. Awesome. <laughs> I actually had a question about it, and literally within like two minutes, he got back to me. To me. It was a bot. Yeah, <laughs> it was a bot. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, he used to be a heavyweight at 230 pounds. Wow. He went on that Atkins diet. <laughs> <laughs> now, just a light heavyweight at 175, hailing from Augusta, Georgia, home of the masters, a master of network security monitoring, monitoring. Doug Burks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How's everybody doing tonight? You having fun? Everybody enjoying ShmooCon? Excellent. Excellent. So as he said, I am Doug Burks and tonight I'm going to be talking about Security Onion and uh, so this is not related to last night's talk. Security is like an onion. Uh, so this will not make you cry, although it may make you cry tears of joy uh, because it saves you so much time and effort. Uh, so we'll see. So a little bit about me. I'm a Christian. I'm a husband and a father. I am a SANS GSE and community instructor. I work for a little company called Mandiant. And oh, by the way, we're hiring. We're a great company. So if you're interested, come talk to me later. Always hiring. Absolutely. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Doug Burks, and if you feel like live tweeting tonight's presentation, you can use hashtag security onion. Creative, I know. Okay, so I could talk about security onion for like hours on end, but I only have like 15 minutes. So in the immortal words of Jerry Reed from Smokey and the Bandit, we got a long way to go, but a short time to get there. So you, gotta, you folks got to listen quickly. I'm not going to sing that. Would you like to? Oh. There you go. OK, so let's talk about establishing the needs. So how many people here are responsible for defending a network in some way, shape, or form? Good number of people. OK, so how many people have a home network, and you're just like interested in seeing what's going on on your network, maybe looking at the traffic on your cable modem or whatever? OK, cool. How many people are just drunk, and you're going to heckle me for not exploiting anything? OK, we got a few hands. OK. <laughs> Well, just keep the heckling to a low roar, okay? Excellent, excellent. 
Okay, so feel the pain. So I know a lot of people said they were responsible for defending a network. So how many people have real true experience with IDS? Commercial or homegrown? So commercial? Okay, good number of folks. How many people have rolled their own homegrown sensors? You built Snort or Suricata or something? Okay, so how long did it take you to roll that sensor? A week? A, a couple of days, maybe? Never really finished? Yeah, heard that story before, okay. So um, one of the things that, uh, that I'm going to show you in just a couple of minutes, uh, this, earlier this week I did a test. I took uh, my Security Onion, it's a, it's a free Linux distribution. I took the ISO, I booted it, I did the Ubuntu installation, I rebooted, ran through the setup wizard, and in a total of eight minutes had a fully functional intrusion detection system. Has anybody ever done that with a commercial IDS, eight minutes start to finish? Or homegrown, anybody? Okay. So uh, let's talk about um, IDS. So there, there's a little more, bit more of pain with IDS uh, because if you just have IDS alerts, do you have the entire picture? So you're looking at your IDS alerts, does that tell you everything that happened? Or is it just a snapshot in time and you don't know exactly what happened before the alert or after the alert? Right, so you see the alert and then you're going to have to go do some forensics or some investigation uh, on the machine to figure out what's going on. So really what we're looking for uh, with Security Onion is network security monitoring. So with, with NSM, we take IDS alerts and we add a whole bunch of other data to the mix. Right, so we have full packet capture, uh, we have session data, think of like NetFlow type data. We have transaction data, so we have HTTP logs. Even if you don't have like a proxy server on your network that you can go look at those logs, uh, your sensor is going to be building those HTTP logs and you can go reference those. So what does it take to actually get all of this NSM goodness? So if you were to build this by hand, this is kind of the diagram of the pieces that you have to put together. Uh, so has anybody ever tried to build Squeal and all of its components? Good number of people. How successful were you? Good, successful. Did it take you a while? Yeah. How long did it take you? Yeah. So a little bit more than eight minutes, right? So we're going to do that in eight minutes. So what's the answer? So Security Onion is a free Linux distro for NSM. Uh, as I said, uh, it is based on Ubuntu. And uh, it's very easy to use. I've got a setup script which asks you a couple of simple questions and you're off and running. Uh, the goal is that we could take just a Windows administrator who knows how to click next, next, finish. And he can instantly do NSM. Okay, so let's do a little demo here. So this is Security Onion. So for the purposes of time, uh, with the magic of television and a little bit of virtualization, we've already done the installation, the Ubuntu installation. We're going to run through the setup wizard. Let's hope that the demo goes well. Okay, so welcome to Security Onion Setup. We're going to say yes, we want to continue. We want to choose Quick Setup because we don't have a lot of time, right? So all we have to do is put in what we want our username to be. I'm going to be creative and use my name. What's your email address? And a password. Okay, so it's collected all the information it needs. It's now going to configure all of the individual services automatically. So we say yes, proceed with the changes. And this will take about two minutes. So I said before eight minutes. You spend about four minutes doing the Ubuntu installation, you reboot. And this will take uh, a couple of minutes to configure all the processes, set the database up, and get everything running. Uh, I'll go ahead and mention uh, we do have Snorby, which I'll show you in just a second. Snorby, has anybody seen Snorby played with it? A few people. Uh, so Snorby is uh, pretty cool. It's sexy. It's Web 2.0, Ajax, Ruby on Rails. It's buzzword compliant. You've got to love that. All right. What does it do? So it's a web interface for your IDS alerts. Okay, so I'm actually going to show you three different interfaces, ways that you can look at the IDS alerts uh, that you have coming out of the system. Okay, so we're done. Security Onion setup is now complete. So for those of you who have rolled your own sensors in the past, 
Was this a little bit faster? Just a little bit? A little bit. Okay. So here we go. Let's go take a look at Snormy. So it does take a second to initialize. Don't do it, it's evil. All right, so we use the credentials that we gave it earlier. Notice the beautiful Web 2.0 Ajax buzzword compliant interface. It does have a nice dashboard. Um, so we go to events, and this is where we would see our IDS alerts. We currently don't see any because we don't have any traffic going, right? So I'm going to go down here and just run a little TCP replay. We're going to take a, an old PCAP from the HoneyNet Scan of the Month project. This is from years ago, but it's a nice little PCAP. We're going to replay it to our ETH0 interface, uh, where all of our processes are listening. So that's done. So now if I go back to Snorby, click my Events tab, now we see our IDS alerts. Right, so for each of these, I can go and drill into them. And I can take a look at source IP, destination IP, all of the, the header information. I can view the rule that generated that alert to figure out, okay, why does it think that this traffic is suspicious? Uh, but so one thing I'll say about Snorby, it's, it's new, it's fresh. They're adding ideas to it all the time. Uh, but currently, our implementation only has the IDS alerts. And I said before, that's a bit of a pain because that's not the complete picture, right? We want additional information to go along with those IDS alerts to aid us in our investigation. So let's, uh, let's go from Snorby to our next interface, which is Squirt. Squirt is another web-based interface. It's going to give us a little bit more information. So we're going to log in. Notice that it, it does kind of look, uh, it's got a dashboard just like Snorby did, so it shows you some good information up front. One thing to notice here is that uh, I said that Snorby only shows you IDS alerts, so it was only getting information from Snort, right? But with Squirt, we're seeing other agents like SanCP, the connection profiler, so we're getting uh, session data. PADS, the Passive Asset Detection System. So we're doing some um, passive fingerprinting there. And OSEC, a host-based intrusion detection system. So all these services are automatically running, and they're all reporting back information uh, that they're seeing on the network. We can go across the top here and click Signatures. We've got nice, pretty graphs to look at uh, the alerts in aggregate. Click on the IP tab and see some, again, some nice, pretty graphs that you can use for drilling into the data. If we had an internet connection, we could do GeoIP lookups for the source and destination IP addresses. And we go over to the Query tab. We drop down and do, I want to do event detail and submit. And here we'll see our actual uh, IDS alerts that we saw in Snorby before. But notice that we do see additional events like this pads new asset. right? So it's seeing new services running on your network. And down here, Somewhere we should have an OSEC alert. But so that does help aid us in our investigation. So that's the second interface that I want to show you. Now, now that's giving you a little bit more information than Snorby did. Now I want to show you what's really the powerhouse for uh, looking at your alerts. And that's the actual squeal console. So we log in here. And we select all. We start squeal. And the same thing. Notice that we have our alerts here. One thing to notice is that uh, squeal does correlation. So for each of these individual GPL FTP site overflow alerts, instead of listing them individually, it's correlating them and increasing the count to 36. Right? So it's easier to look at these things in aggregate that way. Uh, the other thing that I'll show you, in addition to uh, all of these agents that we have running in Squeal, the SANCP, the PADS, the HTD Prime for your HTTP transactions. Uh, Squeal has got access to full packet capture, and this is huge, right? So if you're looking at an alert, say this FTP site exec, and I want to, so I can look at the rule that generated the alert, and I can show the packet data just like I could see it in Snorby or in Squirt, but let's say I wanted to see what happened before the alert, 
or after the alert. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go control click on the alert ID. It's going to go to the full packet captures, pull out the entire conversation for that source and destination IP, and it's going to show me the ASCII transcript. So we can see here the attacker actually connects to our FTP server, uh, attempts to, then he sends a site exec buffer overflow. We can see this happening, him sending the buffer overflow. Eventually we get down here a little bit further. Should be almost there. Here we see the attacker sends bin sh. Then he sends the id command. We see that he is running his root. So now do we know what happened here? Do we know if this is a successful compromise? Yes, we do. Absolutely. We know it's successful. So we can scroll down here. We can see the, the attacker looking through the box, seeing what's going on. And we can look all the way down at the bottom. We see him looking through directories and looking at the password file. So this was just in a couple of clicks, pivoting from an IDS alert and getting a huge amount of information about what happened before and after that IDS alert. Okay, so that's Squeal. So let me show you one other thing. So uh, just as quickly as we can set up this first sensor, we could set up a second sensor. So let's say that you know, we're here at ShmooCon and we're running ShmooCon Labs. So we want to set up a sensor here on this network and then we've got another network on the other side of the building so we've got to an place another sensor there. So let's go run through the setup wizard on our second VM. And this time we'll use advanced setup instead of quick setup because we just want to choose a sensor. And we're going to point it at our server. We enter our username on the server. We keep the default of snort. We choose our interface. And we proceed. Setup has all the information it needs. It's going to automatically configure everything. It's going to connect over to the server, and set everything up on the back end. And in just a few seconds, it'll be done. Same thing as before, it does all the configuration, it starts all the services for you. As soon as this is finished, uh, we'll do the same thing. We'll replay a PCAP so we can see that this sensor is up and running and transmitting all of its alerts back to the central server. All right, that's done. So we go here, we replay our PCAP. That'll take a few seconds. And while that's running, we can go back over to our Squeal console. We go to Change Monitored Networks. Notice here that we have our Shmoo Master, which was our first sensor that we set up. Now we have Shmoo Slave. This is our second sensor. So we select all, start Squeal. And if we look at our sensor column, we have our original Shmoo Master alerts. Scroll down, we have our Shmoo Slave alerts. Right, so we, because we replayed the same PCAP, we see the exact same alerts on Shmoo Slave. Is that beeping for me? Okay. All right, so I'm going to uh, very quickly wrap it up here. So I showed you the web interfaces. I showed you pivoting to full transcript, uh, how quickly and easily you can set these things up. There's a ton of other useful features uh, in Security Onion. Uh, so please play with it. Um, if you want to see it in action tonight, you can actually go down to Shmoo Labs. They have it up and running. My friend Liam Randall, he, uh, he set it up with this beefy server, and they're actually monitoring live data with Security Onion right now. Uh, so if you want to learn more, go to my website, securityonion.blogspot.com. Uh, please, if you enjoyed this presentation, if you like Security Onion, please, please, please vote for Toolsmith Tool of the Year. You'll see the link very, at the very top of the page and uh, some other links to get you started with the project. One last thing, in honor of Steve Jobs, uh, if uh, anybody is interested, please come up. Uh, I have some Security Onion DVDs to give out for free. So thank you all very much. There he is. Scott's the man. Scott's got the DVDs. <laughs> Look at that. All right. Toss it out. All right. If you want a T-shirt, yell Security Onion as loud as you can. Security Onion! <laughs>
got more, we got more, keep them coming. Sorry. And so uh, I've got a question. Does anyone here want to go to the party but doesn't have a wristband? Uh, okay, does any of you have a t-shirt that you can trade for a wristband? Okay, that's okay. Um, come see us in the back of the room if you see. Okay, um, we got one. Hey, hang on. And now, um, yeah, so anybody who, um, women first, of course. Any women in the room would like to go. But I, uh, <laughs> okay, so we got two down. Now there's three left. Uh, come see us in the back. Yeah, okay, cool. What? Where the, uh, where is the wristband person? Is the wristband person? Uh, yes. All right. Could you also hand me that bag? Yeah. Okay. One IPA open. Uh, snake dog. No time to experiment. We've got to stick with the classics. I'm good on the beer. I'd like to thank the Snake Dog Brewery for sponsoring this research. So, everybody's going to probably bail right after this, but I just wanted to give a big thanks to all the volunteers, all the sponsors. Um, thank you. Yeah. All right, so for our last speaker, Mr. Travis Goodspeed. The good behind the good fet. The real, <laughs> the real man with the pink pager. Do you have it? I uh, know. Oh, <laughs> the one who puts packets in packets, Travis Goodspeed. Right. Howdy. All right, so show of hands, who likes defending stuff? Get out. <laughs> who likes breaking stuff? Now, usually when, we, usually when we break stuff, we're exploiting a bug, right? Here, we're not exploiting a bug. But we're going to be breaking all sorts of shit. Uh, who recognizes this diagram? Whoever thought this would be useful to understand? <laughs> I'm really surprised. You knew more than I did. So this is how we're all taught to do networking. We're taught that you have uh, layer 7, which is wrapped inside of layer 6, which is wrapped inside of layer 5, and then it goes all the way down to the bottom at layer 1. And we're taught to believe that each layer will properly deliver frames that came from the last one. And we believe this because every time we get a packet, the checksums make sure that there's no damage in it. And the only exceptions we see to this are when we intentionally turn checksumming off. But it turns out that checksumming is only intended to prevent against accidental error. And what I'm about to present today is a remote exploit for layer one that exploits the physical medium of a wireless network in order to inject a raw, a raw packet, a raw frame. There is no software bug in the stack that we can blame. There is no hardware bug in the receiver that we can blame. This exploit is standard compliant 
and portable to almost every wireless networking protocol that includes a variable length field and lacks cryptography. Not that any of us would know where to find any of those. <laughs> and as I go through these slides, I, I want you to think back to Atlas's talk on layer one. And whatever pieces of that looked foreign to you, I want you to realize that that, that foreignness of it, that, that lack of understanding of how layer one works, is just as much of a mistake.